Got it. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Rock Shop with Ralph, your source for all things entertainment. Tonight, I can't believe who I have in front of me. We have fellow podcast host, host of Rock Talk Talk with Mitch LaFon. Mitch LaFon. Good day. You, Good. You know, to be uh, to be honest, I, I actually came back from the bank cashing a podcast check. Huh? Wow. Huh? At least I, you're getting paid, brother. I do, which is nice. Yeah, this is my passion. So uh, <laughs> what, what you see here is what you get. <laughs> it's okay. It's, we love it. We love the rock shop. We've got a nice logo. we got a nice t-shirt. we got the whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get you one of my t-shirts too, brother. I'll try to get you one of mine. I'll if definitely I... get you one of mine. But anyway, uh, thanks for coming on. I got to yeah. tell you, I've been a fan for years now. Um, you're one of my influences, why I do what I do. I mean, uh, I, I was always told, you got to put all that knowledge to good use. You know, I, I've been known as the king of users information. I've said it in many of my interviews and um, the people that I know, and we put it to use and we uh, we do our interviews and we, we talk about our music and our yep. movies. And uh, I love it. Nothing better. But I'm here to pick your brain, and talk about you. I wanted to turn the tables yep. and interview you because you're always interviewing everybody else. I am, which, it, you know, it's fun to do the interviews. I, I like asking questions. I get to be the nosy neighbor, but get paid for it. <laughs> Just yes, And you, you've interviewed some heavy hitters. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been getting my feet wet. I had, you know, some, some okay, uh, no, not yes. A, not enough anybody, had, but you've you know, had some good ones. Aerosmith. Yes. Leopard, yes. Judas Priest, Bon yep. Jovi, just to name a few. And what I want to start is, is this right? Your first interview was in 1980. You interviewed, of all people, Gene Simmons. Correct. That is How right. How did that come about? Well, that, that that was actually first of all, it was it was a product of the time. You, you know, you can't get an interview that way anymore. But on the back of every record back then, and I guess maybe now, uh, there was management info and, and, and publicist info. You know, it'd be like Kiss is managed by Ocoin Management. So I phoned the uh, the New York operator. I got a phone number for Ocoin Management. I phoned and I said, is the band available for an interview? And they said, yes. Wow. I mean, that was it. I mean, now there are so many gatekeepers with so many different agendas and so many different reasons to not give you an interview. But I literally, I, I dialed, I, I listen, I remember it. It was, it was 212-555-1212, which was the area code for information, information. For, for New York. I'm from Queens. I know that number. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I said, can I? And now, to be fair, uh, at 11 years old, I, I was... Uh, tested by the, you know, for English, and, and I had a university level English. So I spoke very well. So when I got on the phone, I sounded like a, you know, a professional writer or a professional interview. Like I didn't sound like a kid. You know, I had proper language, proper. And I said, may I interview? And now the funny thing is, is that they actually set me up with an interview with Paul Stanley. And it got canceled, and they phoned me, and they said, would it be okay if you interviewed Gene? I was like, would it be okay? Oh, it'll be okay, right? Yeah, that'll work. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll interview anybody. You know, I'll interview Bill O'Coin. I don't, I don't care. And uh, they said it has to be in person. Now, remember, you know, 1980, there's no Zoom. There's no trying to tape a conversation on the phone was, was even, you know, now you plug wires in and plug. You, you couldn't do any of that. So uh, I had my mom drive me to New York to interview Gene, and she acquiesced. She said, yeah, I'll take you. Why not? Wow, that, that is awesome. Do, do you remember the first question that you asked him? Uh, I should, because I actually, every so often, I, I, look, at, I look at the video, because I, I, I set the audio up on YouTube. I think I asked him about bootleggers, if I'm not mistaken. Is it okay to bootleg? Uh, because I, I've always been a big fan of buying music, Right. And there was a store in Montreal that called Rock on Stock that sold a lot of bootlegs. And so I, I remember thinking, is this okay? Is this stuff approved? And I asked Gene, and he said no. And uh, yeah, we had that, that discussion. And uh, that was part of what led to my 
uh, ability to, to be in the KISS camp for a little bit is uh, I would buy pictures. You know, people would sell concert pictures of, of KISS. And uh, Gene had said, well, you, you send me those addresses. You know, you send me where you're getting this stuff from. And I was a kid. I went, you know, I, I gave it to him. I, I had no idea what it meant. Probably meant that they got sued, right? Yeah. He, but, yeah, sure. I, I, yeah, I stirred stirred the pot. But I didn't know. I was So I gave him the stuff. And he sent me a note. And then he sent me some Christmas cards. And, and on the back of the note, it said, uh, you know, you can come to any show. Uh, just give this card. And, and it worked up until the reunion tour. Really? Yeah. So every show I would go and I'd give them the, the card. You know the postcard. It was a it was a postcard. It was the it had Gene's face from the Alive Two um, album cover with, with the blood. blood yeah, I've posted that picture on Twitter and Facebook. You can you can find it. Um, in fact, if you if you look up Mitch Lafon like June 9th, because I the, the interview was June 9th, so on June 9th I post that you know sort of traditionally, and uh, yeah, it, it worked and. Um, when we got to the uh, reunion show in Montreal, I gave them the card. And the guy brought, you know, the tour manager brought it back to Gene and it got approved. And they and there they gave me uh, tickets, third row, third row right in front of Ace, which is not a bad place to be for a reunion show. Yeah. And uh, the tour manager came back and said, here are the tickets. You're, you're going to sit third row uh, in front of Ace, blah, blah, blah. He goes, and Gene wants you to know that this was the last time you get to use this. Uh-oh. And I went, hey, listen, 1980 to 1996, 16 years of tickets and pass. Okay, I'm okay, fine. I had a good run. Right. We're good. Now, I'm not going to complain. And I don't complain. It, it was very kind. So anybody who says, oh, my God, it's how horror. It's not horrible. Got 16 years of passes and tickets. Have you been in contact with them after that? Have you interviewed anybody after that, or they like after '96? Well, yeah, of course, I've, I've interviewed all of them since then. Uh, uh, I have interviewed every. Well, let me think. I've, I've interviewed uh, every living member of Kiss, right? I've interviewed Tommy. I've interviewed Eric. I've interviewed. Uh, I've interviewed Vinny Vincent. I've interviewed Bruce. Uh, I've interviewed Paul. I've interviewed Gene. I've interviewed Ace. Yeah, so. All the living members. I, I've interviewed Peter. I actually wrote Peter last week and and uh, trying to set up an interview. We'll see how that goes. Right. What, but, what do you think? What do you think the status of them joining joining the end of the road? What do you think that's going on with that? Well, joining. They're not. I don't see them joining. You know, will will Peter so, show up and sing Beth? Perhaps. Will Ace? You know, play guitar on rock and roll all night? Probably. Yeah. Uh, that's a different question. I don't know if they're going to do a guest spot and, and sit there for two hours and put makeup on. And right. two aces on stage would be very Phantom of the Opera. No, not Phantom of the Opera. Phantom of the Park. <laughs> kiss, kiss Phantom of the Park. So, uh, yeah, I, I do think that they'll they'll make a spot. But, you know, I, I think they've made it difficult because I'm sure that to do one song, they probably want X amount of money and X amount of... And it's just like, oh, for fuck's sake, just show up. and Can we swear on your show? Absolutely. I swear, I swear on mine. Every just show up and play. You know, s well, stop it. Here's my take. What I think is going to happen is I think the very last show at Madison Square Garden. I think they're going to show up and they're going to play in full makeup. I really is it Madison Square Garden or is it, uh, yeah, it the Madison. the Mets uh, where, where, City Field or whatever it's called? Well, no, it was Madison Square Garden as, as of last year. It was Madison Square Garden. Now oh, I thought it was City Field. City Field, but what when they play that last show in New York. Let's just say New York. Um, I the New York area. The tri-state area. Yeah, exactly. Let's just, let's just say the New York <laughs> In the States. When they play that last show in America. Yeah, we got to make sure we have our facts right because we have two podcast hosts here. Um, yeah, I believe they, they're going to play in full makeup. I mean, they started in New York. I mean, I'm from... They, they, they grew up 10 minutes from where I live, you know, in Queens. And, right. and they have their roots here. And, and those guys started the band, you know... Of absolutely, they screwed it up three times. Uh, how many? How many times you want to count? Uh, but they owe it to the fans to just. You know, this is the last time we're going to be on stage. Supposedly, we both know, Mitch. Supposedly. Well, remember, they never said that it was a farewell tour. They said it was the end of the road. So semantically, it, 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 there's no end. I mean, semantically, it's the end of the road. They're not doing touring. They never said they're not playing shows. 
like the scorpions remember they remember they said it was the end of end of end of be all end all and then scorpions still go out and well and they play. listen ozzy does it the who does right. it thunder do it they all they they all do it even even motley crew the end um they were very clear about saying the end of touring they never said the end of playing shows so i i do think kiss will do one-offs going forward I really hope so, because like we both know, and, and you, I'm a diehard Kiss fan. You're a diehard Kiss fan. I mean, I, I support them, whether it's Tommy, Ace, Peter. I'm not one of those guys that say, oh, only the original members. No. I mean, I loved I loved um, Sonic Boom. I loved Sonic Boom. I thought it was right. a great album. Um, well, the original member thing for any band is completely ridiculous. I mean, uh, you know, if you sit there and go, oh, it's only the original members. Like, really? Do we want to go back to a Judas Priest and bring back Al Atkins? Because that's the original band. You know, uh, look right. at Iron Maiden. I mean, uh, yeah, no, but before that, I mean, there was all kinds of other people. Uh, you know, like, like, stop it with the original member nonsense. The well, fact is, is that Kiss exists and a lot of bands exist with new members that bring in new blood, you, you know, get over yourself. Are you going to say that, oh, UFO, if it doesn't have Michael Schenker, we'll forget the Paul Chapman years. I'm like, shut up. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, let me ask you, Mitch, because you, you've done hundreds of interviews, hundreds. Yes, and Which, about three or four good ones. So, mention them. <laughs> out, of, out of your three or four good ones, which ones are your favorites? Well, it's going to have to be to with the subject, you know. Uh, I, I, of course, love that first one with Gene because it sort of set the everything in motion. Look at that one. Uh, I just interviewed Lou Graham that I saw you commented on on Facebook. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you're interviewing a, a legend like Lou Graham, which I have three, four times, when you're interviewing Rob Halford, who's just a, a sweetheart in interviews. I don't know how he is backstage and stuff, but he's a sweetheart in interviews. Alice Cooper... Um, any of those people, you know, you, you can't go wrong. They, they've affected uh, your life. And, you know, recently I did Miles Copeland, who's Stuart Clo uh, Copeland's brother, but it was also the manager for the police and Sting and, and a bunch of others. And I find those interesting, too. I find that, you know, people say, oh, that's an off the beaten path. And okay, whatever. I don't have a path. I like those ones because it's different stories. It's different flavors. It's different textures. It's not just... Yeah, we write a song, we record it, we put out the album, which are fine. Those are fine. I'm not complaining at all. But I like doing that other stuff. I've got an interview with Flock of Seagulls coming up. I thought that was fun. I've got uh, I've got an interview with Bonnie Tyler that I haven't posted. Jeremy, my partner, has posted it. Not my partner. Jeremy my, White. Hello, Jeremy. My, Jeremy White, the, uh, the co-host. Let's not call him my partner. That means something very different in 2021. He just landed an awesome gig. I congratulated him. Yeah, he's... Uh, he's uh, simultaneously on the air in montreal and in toronto from 7 to 11 every day the number one and number two markets in uh, north or in uh, canada i should say Good and friend. two different shows it's not the same show he does yeah. he, he does one show live and the other show he does sort of in the afternoon and does the pre-tape and then they they feed it but yeah it's, so he's basically doing 10 hours of content in a day all right, well, night, no, uh, four and four, eight, eight hours of content in a day. My math was a little. Here's what I love about you, and, and you mentioned it. So you, you just said you're interviewing Flock of Seagulls. You're, you're like me. I was a kid growing up in Queens, New York, an Italian kid from Queens, New York, who loved, I loved metal. Yep. And I also loved Tom Petty. I yep. also loved John Caffrey. I would listen to Bon Jovi. I would listen to Poison. I would listen to one of our favorite bands, Huey Lewis. News. Yeah. You know, I don't and and during my interviews, I, I try to, I mean, a lot a lot of my interviews have been in the, in the metal realm, right? But I also interview actors, actresses, um, you know. And I would I would love look, let me let me just tell the fans and, and give them the scope of the interviews that you've done. Okay. Yeah. Just, I'm just naming off a few. I mean, I can't go. Tell me how them. awesome I am. I can't wait. I'm telling you how well, I'm gonna. I'm, <laughs> I'm really I'm really giving it to you, Vinny. Huh. Jack Wild, Vinny yep. Vincent, yep. Errol Smith. Miles Kennedy, Stephen Piercy, Phil Collins, Depp Leppard, uh, both we have mutual friend, Ricky Bird, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. Yep. Aldo Nova, I love that one. Joe Bonamassa. Yeah, listen, hey, just before we get to Aldo Nova, uh, first of all, actually, I have a business meeting with him on Friday, but uh, I got to go out to his house because uh, he lives 10 minutes from me. I mean, wow. literally, I just drive down the highway and I'm right there. And uh, we went to his house last uh, last summer. 
and uh, went through the studios and he's like, you know, this is where uh, Richie recorded all his parts for the Bon Jovi live album. I'm like, what now? <laughs> what now? He, yeah. he, goes, he goes, yeah, Obi, uh, Obi and uh, Richie came here and they did all their uh, guitar parts here. And I'm like, wait, in Backwoods, Quebec, the, the, <laughs> you recorded the live Bon Jovi? Okay. And uh, he had a box of tapes. Which it goes, oh, those are John's tapes. I go, what do you mean those? So he put them on, and, and it was just John Bon Jovi and a guitar scratch tracking a whole bunch of demos. And I'm like, why is this on a box of cassette tapes? Like, digitize this stuff. He goes, I don't have time for that. He goes, yeah, yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> Make the time. I mean, as a kid, goes to show you, at ninth, I was 11 years old when Fantasy came out. That song was played everywhere. Oh, my God. Everywhere. That, that jumpsuit that he had on. Oh my yeah. God. And I got I really to hold just, a Grammy. He has a yeah. Grammy in his house. I go, is that the Grammy? He goes, that's the Grammy. Because you want to hold it? I go, yeah, I want to hold it. <laughs> I really wish the country found out about him more when Bon Jovi produced Blood on the Bricks because uh, yeah. you know, it didn't do as well. But, you know, listen, he's still a legend. But that I'm just trying to give the fans the scope. Aldo Nova, Brad Gillis, George Lynch. Yep. Uh, just the, this is just the Lou Grand. Just to name a few. Then, here's what I love. Then he interviews Boy George, Banana Rama, Rick Ashley. <laughs> I mean, never gonna give you up. Rick Ashley was the nicest interview. Him and um, Jim Kerr of Simple um, Simple Minds. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say Simple Plan, Simple Minds. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, uh, you can say what you want about Rick Ashley, and I know he's become sort of a, a joke. But listen, that joke has 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 become big big business for him. Uh, I can only imagine how much. But I interviewed him, and then he had a show coming up in Montreal. I went to the show. He was as gracious as gracious could be. I mean, he, all afternoon, he was very polite, very there. We took a picture. We did the whole thing. And his show was just a hell of a lot of fun. There were just a lot of 40- and 50-year-old people just having... It was like being on a cruise ship. It was just a, it was just a wild party. And then he starts... He gets behind the drums and he starts, you know, singing and drumming, you know, as if he was Peter Chris or, or Ringo Starr or whoever. And then he does ACDC covers. I mean, wow. you know, if you can go see a, a Rick Ashley show, just go for it. it. It's just fun, you know. Yeah. When I first heard him, I thought it was like this six foot black guy singing, you know. Oh, and he's just amazing. Right. And then I'm, I'm talking about in the mid 80s was 86 when he came out. Yeah. 86. And then when you when you see him, it's this little little guy, yeah. pale skin white guy with red hair. But kind of like uh, that guy, Dan Hartman, you know, I oh, could Dan dream Hartman. about you. OK, G Dan Hartman. Now, he passed let, away, I believe. Let's get let's give you some trivia. Dan uh -oh. Hartman had a disco hit. You remember what, you, what it was? Uh, but it had Vinnie Vincent playing guitar on it. Right. Um, that was my question. And you know who the, the other guitarist was, right? Uh, I do, but I can't remember right now. It was G. Smith from Saturday Night Live. Correct. That, yes. And it was Instant Replay was the song. There you go. If yes, you, I, I can see the video. I can see the video in my head, but I, I can't I, remember. I, I always laugh, Mitch, at that stupid video where Vinny Vincent is going. <laughs> <laughs> Just bopping around, <laughs> Vinny. Man, you know, Vinny, Vinny had the world at his feet with his talent and, and his musicianship. And I don't know, whatever. Well. And we know how he screwed up many times, even the last time with, with um mutual friend of ours, Jim Cream. Yeah. Um, how he they had that whole band ready and and he just, you know, he blew it, but whatever. Water under the bridge. Yeah. What um now we mentioned we mentioned bands that you wouldn't expect uh like if you're interviewing Judas Priest and Metallica and, and Aerosmith, one of our favorite bands between the both of us growing up was Huey Lewis and the News. Let's right. talk a little bit about that. I heard you're friends with Johnny Cola. Johnny and I uh, exchange emails every so often. Yeah, I, I love Johnny. John, John, th that whole band is just fantastic, and even all the new players they brought in, and when they have the Tower of Power, it's just, it's just so incredibly fun. It's a breath of fresh air, you know. When you have the metal pounding you all day, and then you got some Huey Lewis going, it, it's great. And you know, like most of us, I, I went backwards from from sports. You know, f sports was the one where I went, oh, what's this band? I got to buy this. That's where all the hits. And then I go, okay, I need more. And of course, they didn't have more. They only had that. And then you go, okay, so you have the second album. Picture this. Picture this with Do You Believe in Love, written by Mutt Lang and so on and so forth. And then you go back to that first album, and that first album is... 
is just incredible. It's, it's raw, trouble and paradise. The whole, whole thing, thing is. True. Oh, it's it's um, uh, yeah. Some of my lies are true. That that's my favorite song of really? all time. Well, well not they, of all time, do but that every but, once in a while they they do that song. I, I wish that they was going to re- remaster that album or remix it and and put it out again. I I'm hoping for that. I I, be, I believe that that's on the agenda. Really. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully soon. Yeah, it, would, it would it would be nice. That would be great. And here's a little. Bit well, not remaster. Re re. Well, yeah, I remaster, mean, maybe. Remix. remix yeah. Remaster. Yeah, you um, know, people get confused about remixed and remastered. They, you know, re- remaster in layman's term is basically you just take the, the take the music and make it louder yeah, you know yeah, well. <laughs> and and people go oh i've got a remaster it's so incredibly special and it's like you know what when they make a greatest hits to make the song sound the same they also remaster it it's it's not exactly like ah uh... <laughs> it's just equalizing well, i mean layman's term even on the second like you were talking about Huey lewis in the news that second album picture this giving it all up for love was written by phil Linnett from Le- yeah well, of course, uh, Yui and Phil were great friends, and Yui appeared on a bunch of uh, Thin Lizzy albums as as a harmonica player. Yeah, great harmonica. As Huey Louie. <laughs> yeah, uh, and given a uh, yeah, it's, it it's called up. it's called Tattoo or something like that on the uh, Thin Lizzy album. Right. Uh, yeah, here, I'm going to armadillo underneath her pillow. Oh, such a such a great. Such a great song. I'm gonna I'm gonna put up the uh, Huey Lewis discography on my uh, desktop so we can uh, go awesome. over it some more. Awesome. Let's see. Now, it, on, on the lady. Well, here's a, here's a little bit of trivia. And too. the last album, Weather, was fantastic. Yeah, it really was. I'm only seven songs, but what can you do? I really hope he gets his hearing back because I I would see him every time he came. Every time he came, I would go and see him. Well, you know, I saw an interview with him recently. I think actually it was on. Uh, Apple TV or something, where where you, and he had um, not earphones, but uh, hearing aids or, or some kind of contraption. So maybe he's maybe it's fixed. Maybe it's you know, I don't well, know. Ryan Johnson got it fixed, but he didn't have Meniere's disease. No, that's a whole different thing. You know, um, here's here's a little bit of trivia for Huey. Let's see if you know this one. Uh-oh. We were in the band Clover before they started. Um, Correct. Streets of London is a great song. Right. Chicken Farm on the streets of London. Yeah. Now the guitar player in Clover was Alex Cole. Correct. He wrote a major hit in the early eighties with someone else. Do you know what hit that was? Wow. I, uh, I, I don't off the top of my head, but I'm, and I'm assuming it, it must be uh wait, what? And you hear it a lot. It's on the radio. It's at every karaoke. It's, it's, I, I'm assuming it must be with with one of the Night Ranger guys, because there, there was a Night Ranger connection going on in that whole part of the world. Actually, it wasn't, but I'll tell you, Ooh. it was with Tommy Two Tone eight six seven five three zero nine. There you go. Oh, he wrote that really. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. I, see, that's a fact I didn't even know. That's why sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm, I know this stuff and forget, but no, I didn't know that one really. I'm not putting you on the spot, Mitch. I'm just shooting the shit with you and that's why they call me the uh, king of useless information yeah oh, well no. you, you know what uh, i don't feel on the spot i i'm old i forget how, i forget how you know i forget what i did yesterday but that's <laughs> that's the scope of how much of a fan i am of Huey. i mean i love him i love the band i mean every one of their albums they're still on my car and i'm not ashamed to say it growing up in queens like i told you i would i, I got a lot of knack for like and kiss and then you go, I'll listen to Kiss one day, I'll listen to Huey another day. I'll listen to John Caffrey and the Beaver Brown Band. I love them as well. Yeah. John Cougar, Tom Petty, you know, and then I'd go to Metallica, Black Sabbath, Dio. I mean, I would, I'm all over the place. I don't believe you have to be pigeonholed by one genre of music. Nope. So let me ask you this. How do you, how do you come up with your questions? What, what do you, you just, are you just go on the fly or you just, you have, you're prepared, you write them down. What do you do? Um... No, I, I never write a question down. Um, that, that's that's a, a a trick that I came that came that comes out of high school. I used to, you know, you had to do orals. You know, you had to go in front of the class and do an oral or a speech or whatever. And uh, I would write them all out, and then I would melt in front of everybody and get laughed at because I couldn't remember what I wrote. And um, then I just started saying, you know what? And I did a, an oral on John Lennon. I just went up and I and I just said what I knew, and I ended up getting like a hundred. And I just went, you know what? 
I'm just going to do that from now on. I'm just going to go with what I know and not have the stress of, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. So that's how I do my questions. I, I prep. You know, I, I read. Uh, I research. I look for, you know, interesting facts about the band, uh, hit singles or how they write or whatever. And, and, I, and I keep that on my screen on different tabs. I have all the different tabs open with a different research. And, and then I listen. Awesome. So a guy starts talking, you know, let's say I'm talking to Huey Lewis in the news, and he goes, well, you know, when we did that song, uh, If You Really Love Me, You'll Let Me, and I go, oh, okay, boom, okay, from that, from that album. And then I'll start asking questions about that album. And, and, you know, I have stuff ready, and so if they throw something at me, I can react and go, uh, okay, they want to go there, let's go there. They want to go to 1985, let's go to 1985. And uh, it's all on the fly. Um, I would say nine times out of ten it works and the interviews come out absolutely terrific um once in a while you know I'll, you get you get stumped but uh it, it listen it works for me and and it brings me to areas that um i i think it brings me to areas that are different than you know, the person that's written down 10 questions because a lot of people write the same the same sort of 10 stock questions yeah so you know interviewer a or interviewer b and interviewer c they go oh okay uh, tell me about uh, crazy train uh, tell me about biting the bat off the, the head off the, and it and redundant. it does and i do try to provide content that's more conversational and just a little bit different so if you listen you'll you you definitely will pick up something and go oh i didn't know that like you know even Lou Graham the other day, when he started talking about the the Mick Jones uh, thing. Oh, yeah, I want to know what love is, what he said about the... Work. Yeah, now, listen, he's, he wrote about it in his book, and he he's talking... But the way it came up in our conversation was very natural. It wasn't like, so I read in your book, like, it just came up, and, and I don't know, it just, it just seemed to have a different impact when it came up very, in a conversation-wise, rather than, let me ask you about what you wrote, and, you know, because... It, it puts people in a different posture, sometimes defensive, some... Anyway, uh, that that's... No, so I don't write anything down. I, I never have. I've, I've never written out a interview questions. I mean, there, there's stuff that you know just off the top. If you're talking about, you know, you're talking about the new album, well, of course you have to ask a question about the new album. So you don't need to write that down. So, hey, uh, Brad Gillis, tell me about the new and the band played on. Oh, hold on. Let me just... I, I, I just got to check my notes. Right. I mean, you don't have to write that down. You know that. You know, what you're say. <laughs> you, know you know you have to ask that because that's why you're on the phone. You know? Speaking of Lou, I wanted to ask you. Um, he said he was retiring from playing and touring. and he's. I know, and I got to announce that. <laughs> yeah, when, when I saw you interviewing him and he was playing, that's why I said it. On, on, I, I met so, him. yeah, so. Did you mention anything uh, about that? So three or four days after Christmas of... 2018, I guess it was. Uh, that was his last show, and I drove down to Schenectady, New York, to go see it because everybody in the band said, "This is Lou's farewell show. It's done. Bye bye, merci, bonsoir." So I drove down. I, I saw the show, and at the end of the show, he, he he walks out and he says, "Hey, everybody, I want to announce that this is my last show." And I I took a video of it, and I posted that video, and it went viral. I mean, every TV station. You know, Lou Graham announces his, you know, and, and Rochester TV stations were phoning me and going, uh, we'd like a quote, can you? And what happened is Lou retired from doing the Lou Graham show with 75 minutes and 15 songs and that band. Is the, what he does now is he goes on this tour with John Payne's Asia. Who are the singers? And sometimes Steve O'Jerry, formerly of Journey. And they do this 80s night. So the, the Asia guy comes out and does Heat of the Moment and a couple of other songs. And Steve comes out and does a couple of the Journey things. And he comes out and does four or five songs. So he, he's, he's retired the Lou Graham band. And he's retired doing the Lou Graham shows where you go to whatever the Hampton Beach Casino and go see Lou for 75 minutes. But he hasn't retired from performing. So it's very nuanced. 
And some fans might go, well, there's no big difference. I mean, there sort of is a difference. I mean, you know, if I say I retire from podcasting and then I appear on Jeremy's show once every three months, you know, doing a, doing a guest spot, it's not the same as still being in it. So so he, he he's doing sort of like the guest spot. He comes and does, you know, jukebox hero and hot blooded and whatever else. And then he, he goes, has a snack backstage. And well, that's, as long as we get to hear him, that's that that's good. It's yeah, and I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I, I mean, listen, uh, I'm only in my fifties, and I can tell you, everything hurts: the shoulders, the knee, the hips. I mean, I, I, the doctor would, earlier this year was like, you know, we might have to start talking about hip replacement. I'm like, whoa, we'll, we'll talk about that when I'm seventy-five. Like, time out. I so I done four years ago, 47, I had a brand new hip replacement. Well, you see, that's the thing. So when you're 65, 75, or, or you know, pushing 80, like some of, some of them are, you know, Alice Cooper and stuff, I, I can get that you don't want to do 90-minute shows anymore. Yeah. I'll, listen, I'll come out, I'll do four or five songs, and I'll go have a cocktail, and we're good. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that over zero. I hear you. I know, I know we're, we're a little pressed for time. I just have a couple more questions. Well, what we can go to we can go till eight. Okay. What do we got? Um, let me ask you: Who was the toughest interviewer into interview to get? I mean, you, you, you to get him, trying to get him, trying to get him, and then then you finally grab mm. him, you got him. Um, it, it, it's it's going to have to be Paul Stanley, and and that's because it was, you know, twenty five years in the making. So in nineteen eighty, I had been offered Paul. He canceled. And I ended up getting Gene. Then on the Hot in the Shade tour, uh, I was supposed to go to the Montreal Forum and it had been set up and I was going to do something. And Paul had broken his ribs and he's, he wasn't talking before the show. Uh, then when I was writing for, for a magazine, I set up an interview for Paul. We were good to go. And literally like an hour before the interview was going to happen, uh, I got a call from the publicist and said, hey, your editor-in-chief uh, has decided that he wants to do the interview and that important interviews like Paul should go to him and not staff writers. And I was like, huh, fuck you. Yeah. And and that w it was literally stolen from me by, by a, an, an editor. And then there was a couple of other times. Uh, there was one time where I, where I got Paul on the phone, but it was a conference call interview with people from all around the world and everybody got to ask one question. So so when I interviewed Paul in 2018, I guess it was. Was that it? 2018, 2017? It, it was like 28 years of this winding path and near misses. So Paul, Paul you know? Now, yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a long time. <laughs> really long time. I can imagine. I can imagine. What about what about one that you haven't interviewed yet that you've been trying and trying and trying and you can't get? Can you divulge anybody? Oh, absolutely. Uh, listen, I, I've I've repeatedly asked for for Yui Lewis and um, I've I've repeatedly been told, oh, he, he he his hearing he can't. It's tough. It's this and that. Hopefully that'll happen soon. I think I think Yui would be phenomenal. That would be a great get. Uh, you know, I've interviewed everybody in Aerosmith uh, and some of them multiple times. I mean, I've interviewed Tom Hamilton more than once. I've interviewed Joe Perry more than once. I've interviewed um, pretty much everybody in the band more than once, but I've never had Steven Tyler. So so that would be interesting. You know, in, in the Bon Jovi band, I've interviewed a, a couple of them, but I've never gotten John. Um, so th there are still some, and of course, everybody wants to interview Axl Rose, but I mean, we all know that's not going to happen. Oh, God. I don't think that's going to happen. It's not. I mean, it's, it's just simply not going to happen. But uh, I'd love to, uh, you know, I'd love to interview John Bon Jovi. I'd love to interview um, Huey Lewis. Those, those, you know, I'd also like to interview um, Billy Idol. Uh, I, I've interviewed a bunch of people. Uh, whenever a Billy Idol album or tour comes around, I've had a chance to talk to Steve Stevens. I've had a chance to talk to Brian Tishy, who was his drummer at the time. I've had a chance to talk to um, uh, Derek Sheridan, who played keyboard. You know, so I, so I've always gotten the guys that that surround him, but I've never gotten Billy. Billy would be fantastic, you know. And and I've asked, 
multiple times and publicists go, hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, Billy's uh, going to be tough to nail down, but uh, Brian, Brian Tishy's tough. Okay. So, so, you know, I've had a chance. So Billy Idol too. Awesome. I've done Rick Ashley, so. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, once Billy Idol, when he did Rick, Rick Ashley, he did Bananarama. He did Bran- Bananarama was great. I mean. I can imagine. How about and Boy George as well? Boy George was hilarious. I thought he was fun. What, what was so fun about it? Well, just that he got offended at some of my questions, uh, you know, because because when they came to this event in Montreal, it was a charity event uh, about two years ago or three years ago. Uh, it was booked as Boy George and Culture Club, and I and I said to him, I said, well, "Why is it Boy George and Culture Club? You're Boy George in Culture Club," and he's like, "Well, you know," and he seemed a little bit offended by, it. <laughs> but. I thought it was a legitimate question. I mean, you're in a band, you know, it's not Paul Stanley and Kiss. It's not Robin Zander and Cheap Trick. So seems seems reasonable to say, well, why is it Boy George and Culture Club? Did you cut the anyway. interview short? No, well, no. I mean, we had we only had a we had a very hard 10 minutes. So it's okay. We got our 10 minutes, but it, it was funny. Well, I mean, listen, I, this has been really fun. I, I really do appreciate coming on the show. What, what I want to ask you now is yep. what do we have coming up on Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon? Can you give us anything that's coming down the pike? Anything you have in the can that's going to be coming out soon? Anything? Yeah, I have my, I have my schedule uh, right in front of me here. We've got uh, Flock of Seagulls coming up. We've got Saxon. Wow. Uh, that's already been recorded. My, the, uh, the Lou Graham interview, Jeremy put it out. I'm putting out my version. You know, my versions and Jeremy's versions are identical but different. He does the, um, you know, the the three boxes uh, view from Zoom. I do the uh, when the person's talking, you know, so it's, it's full 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 screen me, full screen Lou, full screen Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, you know, sweetens his up with all kinds of whist, you know, uh, bells and whistles. Bells and whistles, the expression I'm looking for. I just put it out raw so that you get it as as it was. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, we've got uh, the Bonnie Tyler interview coming up. We've got uh, uh, Brad Gillis, I mentioned. And then um, I'm actually trying to take a, a, a two-week vacation. I'm trying to, I'm trying to not do anything. Uh, but I've been offered uh, CCR. I've been offered... Uh, I'm trying to think who else I've been offered. Um, uh, I've been offered Neil Morse. I've been offered uh, Anthrax, not Anthrax, uh, Armored Saint. Who well, um, just, just released an awesome, awesome yeah. uh, video. Lone Wolf. Lone Wolf. What a friggin' video and what a song, man. John Bush did not miss a step. It, I, yeah, no. And I texted him. I said, John, this fucking video is awesome. Isn't it? I, I watched it today as soon as you released it because I'm always getting the feed from you and, and I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. Joey Vera is playing his ass off. It's it's a fantastic track. And and what some people don't realize is that the album was actually released in October and this is like the third or fourth single and it's just a fun song and it's a great album. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm definitely getting that album. I, I, as a matter of fact, you mentioned it was out in October. I didn't even know that. I Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because and and the song is is killer. It's a killer song. It's such a great right, so song. We got we got on the Rock Talk with Mitch Lafon coming up. We have Bonnie Tyler, Saxon. Um, yeah. Flock and by the way, song. Bonnie Tyler was great. First of all, she's 70 years old, and you look at that video and you go, "No, she's 45." Right. I saw her. Yeah. Yeah. Just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, she started talking about how Def Leppard's Hysteria was her favorite album to drive to. And I'm like, oh, okay, let's go there. Why not? <laughs> you know? Speaking of Def Leppard, you, you interviewed Phil Collins. What was it, for like two hours? Yeah. That was yeah. a very long interview. Yeah, you know, um, I, I've had a, a, a very uh, good relationship with, with Phil over the years. Uh, years ago, he came to, uh, to Ottawa. Uh, Def Leppard came to play a gig, and the radio station Magic 100 at the time wanted to interview him. So I emailed him, picked him up at the hotel, drove him to the um, to to the uh, what you call it the um, station, and he gets a call from the manager and says, "Hey, we're rolling our buses to the to the venue," and the venue was half away from where they were staying. And he's like, "Oh, I'm just about to do this live thing on the air." 
And uh, I said, well, I'll drive you to the venue, you know. And so I drove him to the venue with his uh, his wife or girlfriend at the time. And uh, I got to the venue and, and, and got to the gate. And uh, they said, oh, you, you can't park here. And I said, well, I've, I've, I, got a, I, got, I got the band. So, you know, and he said, oh, yeah, and got me in, free parking and the whole thing. And then the venue in, in Ottawa is really in the middle of nowhere. They, they built it out in cornfields and there's nothing around it, especially back then. And, and you know, Phil's like, well, well what are you going to do all day? And I'm just like, I'm just going to sit here until the show starts. He goes, yeah, but it's two in the afternoon. I go, yeah, well, I'm going to soak up the sun for five hours. He goes, no, you're not. Come inside. And went inside and saw the sound check and, you know, and, and then I, I, you know, I stayed out of the way and he's like, well, haven't you eaten? I'm like, well, no, he goes, but catering's right there. I go, yeah, but it's not my catering. I can't go in. He goes, get, 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 get. and he's, you know, it's just always been very nice. And, um, and uh, Jeremy struck up his own friendship independently of me uh, with Phil. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, he's a good guy. One of the, one of the good ones. Really, really nice guy. Well, I want to thank you for coming on my show. It's been fun. I mean, you, you, you really got it going on. I mean, I, I love your show. I am a fan first and foremost. I'm so glad you came on, and I thank you so much. So anybody who wants to tune in to – what's that? You're very welcome. Oh, thank you. Now, wants, now I can retire. <laughs> anybody that wants to tune in, it's The Rock Talk of Mitch LaFon. He's all over Facebook, YouTube, and you can find him on m multiple streaming platforms such as yep. iHeartRadio, mm -hmm. um, Spotify, and what else, um, Mitch? Amazon, um, boy, just pretty much all of them. Uh, you know, you can even listen to me in India, and um, do, do follow my Twitter at Mitch Lafon. That one, that one seems to be the the fun spot. Uh, people seem to, to to like that Twitter feed, and it's, I like the discussions that we have. I'll post, you know, on this day this album came out, and people love talking about it. You know, yeah, I get that feed on Facebook. I get that all the time. You do a lot of the, like Guns N' Roses released their album uh, today. Yeah. And, and I don't know if, if I'm uh, better or, or not better than others that do it, but I, mine, I try to make a little bit different. You know, people will say Guns N' Roses released this album today and it did this on the billboard and it did that. And, right. and you look at the different feeds and it's, it's 20 people writing the exact sort of same script. Yeah. Uh, I try to keep the script different. I try to make it personal. I try to make it uh, 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 debatable. Like today I said, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses released the, the greatest debut album ever. Now, to me it is. You know, uh, people go, well, it's Van Halen 1. You know what? Van Halen 1's a great album, but it didn't speak to me at that time. I found about I found out about Van Halen 1 like 10 years after. Yes, because we're the same age. And right, because we're the same age, and it, it, it wasn't part of my, yeah, my was, growing yeah, up. 78, and, and Guns N' Roses came out in 87. Right. In 1987, Guns N' Roses was my world. Right. Well, well actually, probably more like in 1988 they were my world. It took a while for that. It was a slow burn. But, yeah, when I look back at albums that I bought that impacted me, that's the greatest. Anyway, so I make it like that, and, and people debate that and talk about it, and, and it just makes it fun. You know, I mean, I had I had like 100 people today tell me, no, it's Van Halen's album. It's like, okay. Well, they're not wrong. Yeah, but, they're, but they're not wrong. It, it's their favorite debut album. Exactly. It's their and, exactly and, right. and everybody has different favorite debut. I mean, I'm sure somebody's going to tell me The Cure has the best debut album. Okay, not to me. Right. <laughs> So, so I know I like that. I like that debate. But um, thank you so much, Mitch, for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, keep on following you. Keep keep up the good work. I mean, you're great at what you do. And I will talk to you another time. Thank you very yes. much. And now, are you going to get Jeremy on the show? Absolutely. Because he he generally follows everything I do. <laughs> oh yeah. So should I call him up tonight, or should I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, send him a screenshot and say, "Hey, Mitch did the show. Now it's your turn." Well, he's friends with me on Facebook. He's going to see it. It's, this is going to be on my personal and my show page. So, Oh, nice. Well, there it. you go. And I'll send it to you in Messenger if you want to see it as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't say anything controversial, so. Yes. Thanks a lot. And, and Yui Lewis. Best Yui, band. baby. We, we could talk off the air. I could talk to you for hours about him. Oh, I love Yui. I've only seen him live once, by the way. Oh, my God. He, he well, the, um. The, the few times he's come to Montreal, I've always had something interfere. 
Wow. There's always been some reason for it to not work out. I actually only saw him in Verona, New York. That's close. So, I mean, it's upstate New York. I mean, uh, yeah, it's down by uh, Utica. 20 times, 20 some odd times. Yeah, once. I've seen him once. Wow. He would come, it, it, it was like a rite of passage for me and my wife. We would, he would come once once a year, all, royally in the summertime. He would tour in the summertime and come. He would play. He would play, um, you know, in Westbury and he would play in the city and he would play all over. But anyway, yeah, and those, mm. days, are, those days are long gone now. So I'm hoping, 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 fingers crossed. We One more. Him. One more time. I, I, I'm sh- There's got to be a way they can figure it out. Maybe you'll come in the city and we'll see him together. Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, listen, uh, being in the tri-state New York area, it's probably easier to get a band to come yes. swinging by. But, uh, you know, in Montreal, he's, he's from what I know, he's come, I think, three times, and it just never worked out. Yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed, Mitch. And I'm, I'm going to email you regarding the shirt, and I'll stay in touch with you. I'll, I'll message you. on. Uh, there you go. Thanks Thank you, sir. Much. Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon on Facebook, YouTube, all streaming outlets such as Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Yep. Look him yep. up. I'm, and I know you've seen him. He's all over. Thanks a lot, Mitch. Cheers. I'll talk to you.